but this unbridled life is sick and must be healed. It is ailing from many ills. Not only does it suffer from the memory of its fetters, it suffers from what is here our principal concern, from the historical sickness. The excess of history has seized the plastic force of life. It no longer understands how to make use of the past as a powerful nourishment. The evil is fearsome, and yet, if youth did not have the clairvoyant gift of nature, then no one would know that that is an evil and that a paradise of health has been lost. This same youthfulness surmises, however, also with the healing instinct of this same nature, how this paradise can be won back. It knows the juices for wounds and the medicines to combat the historical sickness, to combat the excess of the historical. What are they called? Now, people should not be surprised that they are the names of poisons. The antidotes against the historical are called the unhistorical and the superhistorical. With these names, we turn back to the start of our examination and its quiet composure. With the phrase the unhistorical, I designate the art and the power of being able to forget and to enclose oneself in a horizon with borders. Superhistorical, I call the powers which divert the gaze from what is developing back to what gives existence an eternal and unchanging character, to art and religion. Science, for it is science which would talk about poisons, sees in that force, in these powers, opposing forces, for it maintains that only the observation of things is true and right. The scientific way of considering things, which everywhere sees what has come into being as something historical, and never as something that exists, something eternal. Science lives in an inner contradiction with the eternalizing powers of art and religion, just as much as it hates forgetfulness, the death of knowledge, when it seeks to remove all limitations of horizons and to hurl human beings into an infinite sea of light without frontiers, a sea bright with waves of acknowledged becoming. If only a person could live there. Just as the cities collapse in an earthquake and become desolate, and the human being, trembling and in haste, erects his house only on volcanic ground, so life itself breaks apart and becomes weak and dispirited when the earthquake of ideas, which science arouses, takes from a person the basis of all his certainty and rest, his faith in what is stable and permanent. Is life to rule over knowledge now, over science, or is knowledge to rule over life? Which of the two forces is the higher and decisive one? No one will have any doubt. Life is the higher, the ruling power, for knowledge which destroyed life would in the process have destroyed itself. Knowledge presupposes life and has the same interest in preserving life which every being has in its own continuing existence. So science needs a higher supervision and control. A doctrine of healthy life is positioned close beside science, and a principle of this doctrine of health would sound like this. The unhistorical and the superhistorical are the natural countermeasures against the excessive growth of history on life against the historical sickness.